Welcome to a study of the readings from the Bible that will be presented on this upcoming Sunday. The gospel is appointed to be read from John chapter 21, verses 1 through 19. Let us pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you that as we once again study your word that is presented during this Easter season, that it once again inspires us, fills us with love and joy, and brings us the peace that passes all understanding that we need in our lives today. We thank you for this lesson as we study it today. We ask you to open our eyes, our minds, and our spirits to absorb what you have to say to each one of us as we study your word. We receive this lesson in thanksgiving in Jesus' name. Amen. Looking at the litur liturgical seasons as we are going through them through this year, on the schedule we continue in the Easter season that will lead up to the Ascension and 10 days later after that, the day of Pentecost. On the timeline of the life of Christ, page four, when we zoom into the bottom section, we see that this study we're doing is the last chronological event in Jesus' life that is recorded in the Gospels until his ascension. It is Jesus appearing to the disciples in Galilee. Going to the calendar of the major biblical feasts showing the Jewish months of the year as they correspond to the Gregorian calendar that we use, we're in the spring months of the upper right hand of the calendar. And as we zoom into that section, we observed last week the completion of Jesus' first week after his resurrection, when he appeared before the disciples and confronted Thomas regarding his unbelief until he saw Jesus physically. This Sunday, the third Sunday of Easter, the gospel reading for May 1st is the last report of Jesus appearing with his disciples until his ascension to heaven. Little else is known after this appearance about where he went, who he went with, and what he said during most of the remaining 40 days he spent on the earth before he ascended. It can be fairly certain that he articulated and explained much of what he had said to them before he was executed. When the disciples did not understand what he was saying when he told them several times that he would be executed but rise again on the third day. So these 40 days are the final education that the disciples will receive before they are sent out to proclaim the good news that will eventually reach the ends of the earth. We will have a chance in our study to see how this Sunday's readings relate, as well as how the books of the New Testament relate, as we will examine all three of the readings scheduled for this Sunday. We will study the events described in them in chronological order. So first, we will see the last thing John's gospel tells us about Jesus with his disciples before his ascension. Then we'll look at the first reading for this Sunday from the book of Acts. This will give us a microcosm of how the disciples took what Jesus taught them before and after his resurrection. Not only how to teach about Jesus as the savior of humanity from sin, but also how they exercised the power that the Holy Spirit had imparted on them at Pentecost, enabling them to see miraculous results in the name of Jesus. Then we'll look at the second reading from the book of Revelation. The final book of the New Testament is what the Apostle John saw in visions late in the first century. It gives us a glimpse of what will occur at the end of this world and describes what to expect when Jesus returns and establishes the new heaven and the new earth. So on to the Gospel of John, chapter 21, which concludes the Gospels in the Bible. Verse 1. After this, Jesus revealed himself again to his disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. He reveal, revealed himself in this way. Together were Simon Peter, Thomas called Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, Zebedee's son, and two others of his disciples. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. And they said to him, We also will come with you. So they went out, got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Now, appropriately, 
John's final story about the resurrected Christ is about fishing. Matthew and Mark record that the angel told the women who came to the tomb that, quote, he goes before you into Galilee. There shall you see him. So this is that appearance that they, that they uh, tell about. Seven of Jesus' disciples have decided to return to the fishing business. Now, it was common to fish at night, and what they would use would be torches to attract the fish. But in this particular case, first day after deciding to go fishing, they don't catch anything. Now, these are, these are expert fishermen. They ought to be able to catch fish at any time that they choose to, but here they caught nothing. Now, we don't know if they ever, never did catch anything, but here we are told they didn't catch anything this particular time. So continuing with the account at verse four, when it was already dawn, Jesus was standing on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, children, have you caught anything to eat? And they answered him, no. So he said to them, cast the net over the right side of the boat and you will find something. So they cast it and were not able to pull it in because of the number of fish. So here we have the apostles not expecting to see Jesus, so they don't know that it's him on the shore. In any case, they obey what he says to do, and they catch a multitude of fish. Now, notice he makes them answer that they, on their own, were successful. He said, what's the matter? Couldn't you catch anything? And they said, no. But if you do it Jesus' way, you will be successful. So the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he tucked in his garment, for he was lightly clad, and jumped into the sea. The other disciples came in the boat, for they were not far from the shore, only about a hundred yards. So dragging the net with the fish, when they climbed out on shore, they saw a charcoal fire with fish on it and bread. So we have this instance where John recognizes the Lord. Now we know it's John because he said it was the disciples who Jesus loved. Uh, John never talks about himself in the first person. He never says, I observed this. He always refers to himself in the third person. So here he is saying that, the disciple whom Jesus loved. John recognizes the Lord. Peter jumps in the water and goes the 100 yards to the shore. So here, when they see the charcoal fire with fish on it and the bread, Jesus is using that fact to teach that he's supplying the fire and the bread and the first fish for breakfast. And the catch, catch of fish was also provided by Jesus. So he provided everything that's included in this uh, account so that every blessing is the work of the Lord. Now it says he had a fish that he was cooking. Uh, doesn't tell us how he caught it. He wasn't a fisherman, but he was master of everything. So it would have been interesting to see how Jesus caught that fish. He probably just spoke to it and it just jumped into his arms. I don't know. But in any case, it would be interesting to know. So continuing, Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you just caught. So Simon Peter went over and dragged the net ashore full of 153 large fish. Even though there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come, have some breakfast. And none of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? Because they realized it was the Lord. So here we have Jesus asking them to bring their fish to the fire. This actually is an offer that God makes to us to be co-workers with him. He invites us to join him. He prepares the field and we are co-workers for harvesting of souls. Now, why exactly 153 fish? There's a lot of speculation throughout the centuries about exactly what that number meant. Uh, but Jerome, St. Jerome, who translated the Bible in the fourth century into Latin, believed that since there were 153 species of fish, because at that time that that's what they thought there were, 
this represents every race and culture that God wants to reach, and he is with us when we fish for men. In any case, just so happens to be how many fish were caught. There may be no hidden meeting at all. In any case, they would have, have sold the fish. After all, they were fishermen who would go to market with their catch every day. They wouldn't eat them all. It's what their business was. So they most likely knew exactly how many there were because they sold them. So they would be they would have an accounting of how many they sold. And this selling of these fish, by the way, as they would follow Jesus after this, is the money, the income that they would gain to finance the beginning of their ministry. Now, the Greek words here translated in verse 12, who are you, imply greater meaning than just what is your name. Here, the implied meaning, based on how the Greek words are written originally, is a desire to interrogate Jesus. The word translated who into English here is the Greek word tis, T-I-S, very simple word. It's used in the New Testament 530 times and it's translated into the English word what 260 times, the word who 102 times, and the word why 66 times. So depending on the context, it's translated into English based upon the context of how the word is used. But it may also mean that it contains all of those implied meanings. Uh, they want to know not just who he is, but what, why, how. They want to know all about him and what has happened since he was buried. But at this instant, they are content just knowing it is the Lord. In fact, we have all kinds of questions in our minds today that we say we're going to want to ask when we get there. But probably when we get there, we'll just be content, just like they were, of knowing that it was the Lord. Jesus came over and took the bread and gave it to them, and in like manner, the fish. This was now the third time Jesus was revealed to his disciples after being raised from the dead. So here, this picture is the key theme that nothing is accomplished without the power of God. And that is referenced in Psalm 127, verse 1, recognizing this fact that unless the Lord build the house, they labor in vain who build. Unless the Lord guard the city, in vain does the guard keep watch. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He then said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was distressed that he had said this to him a third time. Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. So here Jesus is turning from fishing to shepherding. Once new Christians are caught, they need to be nurtured. Now in Luke chapter 24 and in Paul's letter to the first letter to the Corinthians chapter 15, it is told, we are told that Jesus had already appeared earlier individually to Peter. And we don't know what was said there. All it just says is that he, was, he appeared to Peter earlier by himself. So here, Jesus restores his relationship to Peter in the presence of the other disciples. Now, Jesus clearly is asking three times because Peter denied him three times. There are other parallels to Peter's denial and his restoration. Both events occurred in, at a charcoal fire. He calls him Simon, not Peter. Peter means the rock. This calling him Simon emphasizes his human nature and the fact that he did not stand as a rock when he was tested. And when Jesus asks, do you love me more than these? 
He's saying, more than the other disciples love me? Well, in the garden, if you remember, Peter said, everyone might flee, but he would stand and fight. Here he realizes fighting is not the way to show his love. Jesus wants Peter to show his love for God through obedience to do what he's now instructing him to do. Peter's hurt because he is being reminded of the three times he denied Jesus. Each of the three instructions now that Jesus gives may sound the same, but they each have a different meaning. Jesus is not just speaking of physical food. He's talking about the spiritual food. So when Jesus says, feed my lambs first, he's saying, teach my children. Lambs are young sheep. Teach my children. Then when he says, tend my sheep, he's saying, watch over my people because they are his sheep, not yours. Then the third time when he says, feed my sheep, this is teaching the word of God to my people. This also becomes instruction for all the disciples who are there listening, but also for Christian leaders throughout history. Then continuing, amen, amen, I say to you, when you were younger, you used to dress yourself and go where you wanted. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. He said this signifying but what, by what kind of death he would glorify God. And when he had said this, he said to him, follow me. So Jesus is telling Peter, his preaching the gospel will require sacrifice, will ultimately lead to his crucifixion. In the upper room, Peter promised he would lay down his life for Jesus, and he ultimately does. Now, the Greek words here at the end of verse 19, follow me, literally means keep on following me. So this is where the gospel reading this Sunday ends. We're going to finish out the chapter, the few verses to end this chapter. Peter turned and saw the disciple following whom Jesus loved, the one who had also reclined upon his chest during the supper and had said, Master, who is the one who will betray you? When Peter saw him, he said to Jesus, Lord, what about him? Well, here Jesus is addressing the problem of rivalry and competition in the church. He's saying, don't be concerned about someone else may be doing about how I may deal with someone else that may be doing something different or may be more popular than you. Just follow me. Be faithful to what I have given you to do. Jesus said to him, what if I want him to remain until I come? What concern is it of yours? You follow me. So the word spread among the brothers that that disciple would not die. But Jesus had not told him that he would not die. He just said, what if I want him to remain until I come? What concern is it of yours? So it's emphasized. Jesus didn't say that John would not die. Just an example he's using. The spread of the gospel is like a symphony orchestra. God's the conductor. We are all to do our part and not be concerned about others. And ultimately, we will come together as one to make beautiful music. We're not in competition with anyone or any other church. We each have gifts to be used. Paul's letter to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 12, 21, tells us never to say we have no need of you or you have no need of me. We're all needed in the body of Christ. As to what God does with someone else, it's none of our business. It's just that we need to follow him. It is this disciple who testifies to these things and has written them. And we know that his testimony is true. There are also many other things that Jesus did. But if these were to be described individually, I do not think the whole world would contain the books that would be written. These last two verses, verses 24 and 25, are thought to be those written by the elders of the church who heard and now witnessed the written testimony of John. Most important message, you do what God has told you to do and he will be with you to support you and will always honor his promises. So that was the gospel reading this Sunday from John chapter 21. The first reading 
then that comes before the gospel is read, first reading this Sunday, comes from the book of Acts. So I'm going to follow with the reading from Acts because that chronologically is what occurs sometime after what's written in the Gospel of John. The first four chapters of the book of Acts describes Jesus' ascension, the Holy Spirit descending on Pentecost, the early teachings of the apostles, and beginning of opposition by the temple leaders regarding their teaching about Jesus. Last week, the first reading was from the book of Acts, chapter 5, verses 12 through 16. We will study that uh, reading as well as then leading up to the Sunday's reading, which then continues later in verse 27. Verse 12, many signs and wonders were done among people at the hands of the apostles. They were all together in Solomon's portico. None of the others dared to join them, but the people esteemed them. Yet more than ever, believers in the Lord, great numbers of men and women were added to them. Thus they even carried the sick uh, onto the streets and laid them on cots and mats, so that when Peter came by, at least his shadow might fall on one or another of them. A large number of people from the towns of the vicinity of Jerusalem also gathered, bringing the sick and those disturbed by unclean spirits, and they were all cured. Now, four things happen when the church operates in the spirit. The first is that power is manifested. Signs and wonders occur when Christians come together of one accord. Now, in verse 15, where it says about his shadow, it doesn't say his shadow healed anybody. It just said that they uh, had hoped that at least his shadow might uh, overcome them. But in any case, Verse 16 does tell us that everyone, not just some, all were healed, all were cured, not just some. Why don't we see that happen today? Well, we're going to see a little bit more discussion about that very thing as we continue the reading here in the chapter 5. Then the high priest rose up and all his companions, that is, the party of the Sadducees, and filled with jealousy, laid hands upon the apostles and put them in the public jail. But during the night, the angel of the Lord opened the doors of the prison, led them out and said, go and take your place in the temple area and tell the people everything about this life. When they heard this, they went to the temple early in the morning and taught. So we have the Sadducees being filled with jealousy. They sent the apostles to prison, and this is the second time earlier in the book of Acts, they're sent to prison. And this will be the second time that happens. The apostles didn't protest. What's interesting now about them being led out by angels is that the Sadducees are that sect of uh, the temple leaders who don't believe in the resurrection and don't believe in angels. And here an angel releases them from prison. Now, the second thing that occurs then when the church operates in the spirit is liberty occurs. There's liberty in the spirit. Second Corinthians 3.17 says, where the spirit of God is, there is liberty. Man cannot stop the power of God. Timothy's second letter, chapter 2, verse 9 says, the word of God is not bound. This is resurrection power, and it sets us at liberty. This is where true freedom comes from. Not from a constitution, not from a secular document. It comes from God, from his holy document, from his word. They were to preach and not hide. When the high priest and his companions arrived, they convened the Sanhedrin, the full senate of the Israelites, and sent to the jail to have them brought in. But the court officers who went did not find them in the prison, so they came back and reported, we found the jail securely locked, the guards stationed outside the doors, but when we opened them, we found no one inside. Now what this shows as the leaders of the temple are trying to thwart the spread of the gospel, 
What will happen is that opposition will arise. We know that Satan will try to thwart the delivery of the message regarding this life, as is told here by the angels. Tell about this life, the life of Jesus. When they heard this report, the captain of the temple guard and the chief priests were at a loss about them as to what this would come to. Then someone came in and reported to them, the men whom you put in prison are in the temple area and are teaching the people. Then the captain and the court officers went and brought them in, but without force, because they were afraid of being stoned by the people. Just as occurred back when Jesus was alive and the temple leaders were afraid that people, too many people were following Jesus. And so they were afraid of what, what might happen. They had decided they had to have Jesus killed. Now they are fearful of what's going to happen again as they're taught about Jesus. Now, at this point, we'll study what the first reading will be this coming Sunday, starting at verse 27. When they had brought them in and made them stand before the Sanhedrin, the high priest questioned them. We gave you strict orders, did we not, to stop teaching in that name? Yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and want to bring this man's blood upon us. But Peter and the apostles said in reply, we must obey God rather than men. The God of our ancestors raised Jesus, though you have killed him by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him at his right hand as leader and savior to grant Israel repentance and forgiveness of sins. We are witnesses of these things, as is the Holy Spirit that God has given to those who obey him. When they heard this, they became infuriated and wanted to put them to death. This demonstrates the continued use of intimidation that the temple leaders use to try to stop the teachings of, uh, about Jesus. And not only that, they just call, they don't even use his name. They call Jesus this man. And here, just as he did in chapter four, previous to this chapter, when he was uh, being questioned after being sent to prison, Peter repeats his statement that he said back then regarding following God rather than men. That was in the book of Acts chapter 4, verses 17 through 20. We have the importance of the fact that Peter is speaking the truth, speaking about the power of the resurrection. He's referring here to what is written in the Old Testament book of Deuteronomy, chapter 21, where it says a person as cursed who's hanged on a tree and that says now that we are redeemed from that curse that was because he was hanged on a tree that jesus frees us as it is said in the book of deuteronomy freed us from the curse of the law in any case the temple leaders had given strict orders saying to them didn't we tell you to stop teaching in his name this is the second time they've told them to stop that so this now relates back to what we said earlier about why aren't healings more um, prominent in the Christian world today? Well, when we fail to understand that it's through his name and through faith in his name that we can made, be made physically whole, that is showing that we're ignoring him as the prince of life just as the crowd did when they delivered Jesus to Pilate. The Old Testament and the laws guaranteed the Jews that if they followed the law, they would be delivered from sickness, from disease, from poverty, from lack of any kind. This is in Deuteronomy chapter 28. Jesus comes and preaches that he's the fulfillment of the law and the prophets, taking us from the old to the new covenant. Peter now then teaches after Pentecost that to enjoy the blessings of the covenant, we need to repent, be converted, turn away from our iniquities. Then we must believe that, as he said earlier in chapter 3, verse 16, that his name, through faith in his name, is the power needed in our lives to fulfill the covenant in our time. So denial of the power in his name is denial of Jesus. 
Now, some ministers and Bible teachers say that this power is not for us today, that it was only for the apostles in the first church age. If that's so, then wouldn't all the other things that we're teaching not be uh, for us today? But Peter is telling us to change our thinking. Repent means change your thinking. We need to change our thinking, our religious thinking, that may have taught us that God wants us poor and sick and destitute, and that it's all for a reason. Jesus tells us to change our thinking when he says to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. That's from Matthew 6, 33. Just before he says this, Jesus talked about how in this world people think about acquiring physical things, material things of the earth first and put their relationship with God afterward. We need to change our thinking and believe that if we do what his word says to do and immerse ourselves, that's what the word baptize means, immerse ourselves in his word and teachings, the promises of the covenant are for us to enjoy physical, mental, emotional, social, political, material, everything that we need if we put him first. But most importantly, it gives us eternal life. But a Pharisee in the Sanhedrin named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law, respected by all the people, stood up, ordered the men to be put outside for a short time, and said to them, fellow Israelites, be careful what you are about to do to these men. Some time ago, Thetis appeared, claiming to be someone important, and about 400 men joined him, but he was killed, and all those who were loyal to him were disbanded and came to nothing. After him came Judas the Galilean at the time of the census. He also drew people after him, but he too perished, and all who were loyal to him were scattered. So now I tell you, have nothing to do with these men and let them go. For if this endeavor or this activity is of human origin, it will destroy itself. But if it comes from God, you will not be able to destroy them. You may even find yourselves fighting against God. They were persuaded by him. After recalling the apostles, they had them flogged, ordered them to stop speaking in the name of Jesus and dismissed them. So they left the presence of the Sanhedrin rejoicing that they had been found worthy to suffer dishonor for the sake of the name. And all day long, both at the temple and in their homes, they did not stop teaching and proclaiming the Messiah, Jesus. So the fourth thing that happens when the church operates in the spirit is they see deliverance, deliverance from the opponents. After God delivers the disciples from prison, it's actually Gamaliel, a Pharisee delivers them from the Sadducees. Now, as it turns out here, we see that Gamaliel is a fence sitter. He had plenty of evidence and could have decided that Jesus was in fact the Messiah, but he chooses to play both sides against the middle. So here, these verses show us that even after they were beaten, they went ahead and continued to preach the gospel. Question is, if we were beaten, would we continue teaching this life, the life of Jesus, as they did? They actually saw it as a sign that they were doing the right thing. Now, when we act on scripture, the power of God is manifested. God has given us the tools and the equipment. And as I said earlier, that Peter said back in Acts 3.16, that it is his name through faith in his name that is manifested with power. So where's our faith? Need to understand that it is his name through faith in his name that the power of God is manifested. So that ends chapter five of the book of Acts. We will then now examine the second reading. The second reading is from the book of Revelation. This is the chart that I use to teach the book of Revelation. If you've ever read it, it's very confusing. There are many interpretations about the details that John records in this book. I use an interpretation that seems to be log logical, but many images in the book defy logic. 
the way the chart shows how the book is laid out is designed to show each event in chronological order. So as a result, some events are concurrent with one another in completely different chapters. So for instance, you can see from this that at the end of chapter six, where it talks about the sixth seal that's mentioned in chapter six, it corresponds to what has occurred in chapter 12. Chapter seven has a long um, chronological section that actually coincides with events that occur in chapters eight, nine, 10, in the beginning of 11, as well as chapters 13 and 14 and 15 and 16 and 17 through 19. So we have all of these events occurring simultaneously, but they're laid out in separate chapters so that when I teach it, try to show the link between those chapters and how chronologically those events played out to show how those events, although written in different chapters, have a concurrence to them in the future chronologically. So just this chart shows how complicated the book of Revelation is. The reading for Sunday from chapter five comes before all of the chronological complications occur. Zooming in to the upper left area, chapters one through five are fairly straightforward. Chapter one is John's introduction to the book itself. Then chapter two and three describe seven churches that existed, as it says at the bottom, two category comparison of the seven churches that are listed. And these seven churches existed in John's time where he writes about each and offers a pronouncement on each one of them. Then as the no notation above chapters two and three say that these are things which are, those are things that happened at the time that John is writing about it. Those are contemporary things occurring while John is alive. Then as you can see, it then starts things yet to come. So chapter four begins with future events. Chapter four generally deals with God the creator, as it says here, and the worship of God as the creator. Then with chapter five, the theme changes to information and worship of God, the redeemer, Jesus. So chapter five begins. I saw a scroll in the right hand of the one who sat on the throne. It had writing on both sides and was sealed with seven seals. Then I saw a mighty angel who proclaimed in a loud voice, who was worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to examine it. Now chapter four describes the throne of God. So that's what's being referenced here in chapter five. And that there are these elders that are around the throne. Verse one indicates so when each seal is broken, the scroll opens with information associated with the seal. So verse two shows the relationship to a verse that will come later in chapter 10, verse seven, which says the mysterious plan of God will be accomplished or revealed. And that mysterious plan of God is actually what will end all of our problems. The title of this scroll is the mysterious plan of God. Now, ancient philosophers wrote about rebellion of youth, breakdown of marriage, eminent possibility of wars, and political corruption in the courts and in politics. They wrote all the way down to the fact that there were potholes in the public streets. And the list goes on and on of all the problems that were faced by humanity throughout its history. Well, we still have the same problems. We haven't made any progress. In fact, seems to be getting worse. So a key question of all time is raised here. Why are we unable to solve them? It's because we try in vain to solve our problems on our own. Verse three says that no one is worthy to open the scroll that will answer all our problems and complete the plan of God. Now politicians, leaders, and dictators have promised to solve our problems over the ages but none have been able to do so. Then John continues. 
I shed many tears because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to examine it. One of the elders said to me, do not weep. The lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed, enabling him to open the scroll with its seven seals. So verse five tells us there is one, the lion of the tribe of Judah, that's Jesus, appearing as the perfect man who can open the scrolls and solve our problems. He will rule with the strength of a lion. Genesis 49.9 establishes Jesus as the lion of Judah. And Isaiah 11.1 1 links him to David from where he is rooted. This gives him the authority to open the seals. Then I saw stand in the midst of the throne and the four living creatures and the elders, a lamb that seemed to have been slain. He had seven horns and seven eyes. These are the seven spirits of God sent out into the whole world. He came and received the scroll from the right hand of the one who sat on the throne. So Jesus appears as he was slain. He overthrew Satan by submitting as a lamb to being slain. The power of death that Satan possesses can only be brought upon sinners. Jesus never sinned, so Satan violated the spiritual law of sin and death. The number seven in scripture, by the way, represents completeness or perfection. A horn represents power, and seven horns represent his absolute and complete power. Eyes represent intelligence, and seven eyes demonstrate he has full and complete intelligence. Seven spirits shows his, that he possesses all the attributes of God that we will see later listed in verse 12. When he took it, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. Each of the elders held a harp and gold bowls filled with incense, which are the prayers of the holy ones. The bowls of incense mentioned here that represent the prayers of the holy ones, or as other translations say, the prayers of the saints. The original Greek word is translated saints more than it's translated those that are holy. There's debate as to whether these prayers are the prayers of the holy ones here at the throne of God or are our prayers, because we are considered holy too. We are considered saints as we are re reunited with God through forgiveness of our sins. They sang a new hymn. Worthy are you to receive the scroll and to break open its seals. For you were slain, and with your blood you purchased for God those from every tribe and tongue, people and nation. You made them a kingdom and priests for our God, and they will reign on earth. This is a new song, as it's mentioned here. It's new to the angels. They never heard the song of redemption before. The saints teach the angels this song because angels cannot experience the redemption that Jesus' blood purchased for us. It's his blood that results in our redemption, and this then becomes a new song that the angels will learn and sing. Then verse 10 talks about the redeemed, those that are purchased for God. They are made to be kings and priests to reign on the earth. Then the second reading this Sunday from the book of Revelation starts at verse 11 here, where it says, I looked and heard the voices of many angels who surrounded the throne and the living creatures and the elders. They were countless in number, and they cried out in a loud voice, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches, wisdom and strength honor and glory and blessing. So these are the seven spirits of God that are referred to back in verse six. They also parallel the attributes of God that are identified in the book of Isaiah, chapter 11, verse two. The spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, a spirit of wisdom and of understanding, a spirit of counsel and of strength, a spirit of knowledge and of fear of the Lord. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea, everything in the universe cry out to the one who sits on the throne and to the lamb be blessing and honor, glory and might forever and ever. The four living creatures answered, amen. And the elders fell down and worshiped. Well, amen, as we know, means Hebrew for 
so be it. So the elders fell down and said, amen. And this is actually then the beginning of the creation of the new heaven and the new earth as the seals will be. Uh, so this reading on Sunday is meant to show that everything in the universe cries out to God, cries out to the one who sits on the throne and to the lamb be blessing and honor, glory and might forever and ever. And it ties in to the gospel where we see the last instructions that Jesus gives before his ascension. And it ties into the book of Acts where it shows the teachings that are made during the time between Jesus' ascension and his return, which Revelation describes and which will usher in the new heaven and the new earth. Philippians chapter two says, therefore God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name. So at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This account in Revelation reflects the scene that every knee shall bow and every tongue confess. And these three readings show us how God's word over the centuries all is threaded together through the blood of Christ. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you, give you the glory. Just as we read about the glorious praising by the elders in heaven, we do the same here on earth. We look forward to your coming. We thank you, Lord, that you've given us your word to be able to walk with, to be able to learn by, to be able to understand your relationship to us, to be able to know that you live within us and that through your word and through understanding of your word, we know we can learn and know how to apply it in our life. We know that your word comes first, that we will look to you first in all that we think, do and say, so that it reflects you and it reflects our belief in you. So we thank you for these lessons today. We thank you for your word. And we receive this lesson in thanksgiving in Jesus' name. Amen.